go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name is Clint Haverty. Uh, I'm from Southern Arizona in the high desert there in Patagonia, which is east of Nogales, Arizona, about 20 miles. Some of the best ranching country in the world. Patagonia is an old mining town. They shipped a lot of ore out of there. And of course the ranches, cattle ranches around there and some of the horse ranches, they sustained the area for quite some time. And the bars did too, of course. But uh, anyhow, I worked on and around those ranches. My daddy used to run ranches and I never run a big ranch, run a little ranch. But, uh, uh, you know, I jockeyed, rode a few racehorses, roped a lot, did this, did that. Uh, kind of whatever it took to fit in if you know what I mean. I was a pretty rotten kid. I got kicked out of school. I don't know how many times, more than I can remember and more than a lot of people want to remember, I'm sure. But anyhow, uh, just south of me there, southwest of me was an old saddle maker named Roy Soggy. And I credit him with keeping me out of jail because he'd stop by my house at 6.30 every morning. He drove a Volkswagen. And last time I saw him, he had three Volkswagens, two on blocks, one almost stripped and driving one and had over a million miles on those three Volkswagens, going back and forth to Tucson, working at Zuri South Saddle Shop, building saddles for him and show equipment. Anyhow, he'd stop and pick me up and I'd go up there with him and sweep his shop out and make a pest out of myself. And, and he sparked my interest in tooling leather and, and building leather products, which I've done for... 65 years, roughly. I'm 75 now. I know I look much younger, but I am 75, by the way. And anyhow, uh, I worked up there with him. Uh, I'm say worked. I, I, I made a pest out of myself for quite some time and everything. And, and there were braiders that would come through there and braid show equipment can, out of kangaroo and whatever. No rawhide at that time. Although my dad and those Mexicans used to braid a lot of, of riatas, uh, that was before they had a lot of nylon ropes and uh, obviously way before poly ropes. And anyhow, they'd work on, on a hide and everything and they'd braid, rain, braid reins or, or uh, riatas or whatever somebody needed. They didn't sell their products. They'd give them to whoever's working on the ranches, that ranch or whatever, you know, and, and uh, whoever needed something, they'd give it to them. And, and uh, I know I got my dad's last Riata that he made, and it's out of Lucy. Now, Lucy was my favorite heifer calf. And I never will forget, they, they uh, down big old mesquite tree there by the house there, they, they harvested her there and everything. And, and uh, the next Sunday, uh, or that Sunday, they cut a strip, cut her hide up in a big old long strip. And oh, I sniffed and cried around there for a day or two. But anyhow, the next Sunday, everybody showed up. I say everybody. Several cowboys showed up there with my daddy, and they had scraped the uh, hair off the hide. The next Sunday, everybody would show up, and my dad had put the, uh, the, the soga in between some wet gunny sacks. So it was re on a Friday. So it would be ready on Sunday for those boys to, to uh, cut it into uh, uh, quarter-inch strips to make a riata out of. Anyhow, that's, that's my earliest knowledge of braiding is watching my dad and watching those Mexicans. And of course they drank beer, so you had to drink beer to work off, I thought. But anyhow, this goes on and I left home and you know I worked on those ranches around there and everything and, and cleaned a lot of pasture, roped a lot of wild cattle up in those mountains, drug them down, this and that, hooked them world mules, whatever I had to hook them to, I'd do it. And, and uh, we, we got along pretty good. And uh, uh, anyhow, make a long story short, I finally, uh, graduated from that and went to training and showing horses uh, pretty much all over the world. Uh, when I say all over the world, Germany, Italy, and a lot in the United States, I used to keep between 40 and 60 outside horses on my ranch that I had in Crem for 40 years and had two or three boys working for me and two or three uh, stall cleaners. You know, we, we worked. We, I'd be horseback at two o'clock in the morning, up at one, horseback at two, and go till I got done. And it was just work. And, and uh, I'd leave the house with five, six, or seven horses to go to a horse show, and sometimes another trailer. I took 23 head off one time, and that was the last time I ever did that. I like to work myself to death. Uh, anyhow, I was in the horse ministry for quite some time. During that time period, 
I started uh, uh, tooling a lot of leather, making belts, more for relaxation than anything. I made a little money, but mostly to relax. Saved a lot of horses' lives that way. And, and, uh, uh, and I always braided. I always did something with, with my hand, braid or tool leather or make something, you know, and a lot of that stuff was for me to use. Some of the stuff that I got that I used is ungodly because it's very amateurish. Uh, I was very, very lucky that it didn't tear up so I would uh, get hurt or something like that. But really, it, 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 it was, it, that's my foundation there. And then uh, I, I, I uh, met a man by the name of Don Brown. He braids a lot of rawhide and a lot of, a lot of hackamores and everything. And, and I had a customer who wanted some reins, and I didn't have time to make those darn things out of rue. And so I called him up and said, Don, I need to order a couple sets of reins. He said, what do you need? And I told him, he said, all right. Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe two months later, roughly, I get two sets of reins in the mail. And, oh, that woman is just ecstatic about them, and I really liked them. So I called him up, and I said, Don, I'd like to order myself a set of reins. He said, I ain't going to make them for you. I said, well, if you're not going to make them for me, what the hell is wrong with you? He <laughs> said, make your own damn reins. <laughs> well, that kind of aggravated me a little bit, and then make another story out of it here. We met at Mel Lawson's uh, sometime shortly thereafter, and then Don and I roomed together. Uh, at the Holiday Inn, and we stayed at Mel's place there for kind of a small gathering. Nate Wall was there, Mel, and several other braiders there in that area were there, and and uh, Sarah Paulson, she's really good, and and anyhow, we uh, had a really great little mini gathering there and everything, and Don and I became pretty good friends. In fact, he's on my speed dial underneath my close contacts on my telephone. But he don't answer the telephone. He's so darn grouchy. He don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> but we became good friends. And I learned how to braid. And I've sent him rawhide. I've sent him strings when he said my hands are tired or sore. Or he didn't have anything. Well, I'd send him something. He had sent me something. And we communicated very well together. And, and gosh dang it, I'm sure I'm glad that I didn't grow up around Don Brown. Because I would be not in as good a shape as he is. Because I'm not as big, strong, or tough as he is. And it's, I mean, he kind of led in there. Anyhow, he's a great braider. Uh, Al Dunning gets everything that he makes. And once in a while, he'll send me something. Most of the time, because he's got to make a living, he sends it all to Al, and Al pedals it for him. Right. And to do very, very well. And and uh, Don, Don makes a terrific half of one. And I've got, I don't know what I've got. I don't have them. My son has them. I have a son that's got a little larceny about him. He gets all my good stuff. I, <laughs> <laughs> but no seriously don has made me some really nice stuff and i got one that's hanging up in the house that several in the house that he's made and one of them is one he sent me to take care of liz uh my wife who died of cancer he said hang it up in the kitchen it's going to take care of her i'll take care of her because you won't you rascal and so <laughs> i hung it up there and that's what it was when she passed and i have it hanging up in my house now hanging hanging up there watching over me and my current wife sheila and so He's taking care of me all the way down the road, so to speak. But anyhow, uh, from there, uh, I started making, of course, I made a set of reins and all that stuff and everything. Uh -huh. and I continued on, and I, I kind of got hooked up on this stuff. This stuff's addictive. Yeah. And I've been 25 years ago, roughly. And and uh, anyhow, since then, I braided a lot of stuff up. And, and I was looking through my pictures the night before last, knowing that you and I were going to talk about this and everything. And I'm amazed at how much stuff I've produced, not only in leather, but in a rawhide, but in leather. It just amazes me. And then I looked on other people's Facebook pages and looked at their photos, and everybody's made so much stuff. And it's just amazing the level they started out. You can see where they started at and where they finished up at. Yeah. It's really cool how everybody has progressed in their journey. And working rawhide is a journey. Mm -hmm. and, and if you treat it, where it's not a journey where you are very self-conscious about your work, ashamed of your work or whatever, that's not the way to treat rawhide. Treat it as a journey. It's a learning experience. And every day you will get a little better at it. You will understand it a little more and you will appreciate it a bunch. Mm -hmm. No, I do. 
That's awesome. <laughs> Don Brown and my grandfather were friends. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I'm, for your grandfather. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up right around there, but I don't know that I've ever met him yet. I'm I'm hoping it's on my. Oh, you have you you need to go meet him, and you need to get him on your podcast. Because yeah. Don's eighty eight. He just had a birthday Tuesday, I think. Okay. And and uh, I, I'd like to see him on here because gosh darn, he's got so much history. Yeah, so, I'm gonna I'm gonna do my very best. It's quite a drive. Perfect. <clears throat> you covered a lot of the questions already. Um, what was your goal when you started? When I started braiding, what was my goal when I started braiding? Yeah. To not get killed if something broke. Yeah. <laughs> you got to remember when I started breaking braiding. Oh gosh, I was probably uh, 10, 12 years old, something like that, you know. And I had my Shetland pony named Calico. And we traveled many a mile behind my daddy, and I'd have my fine little reins that I'd braided, of course, little rope and reins that had a string coming off of the hole. Anyhow, I wanted to make sure I didn't get killed. And so everything I braided was pretty strong, pretty stout, a little bit big, but it was darn sure going to be there. Anyhow, as time goes on, you learn how to refine your work and take advantage of the strength and the qualities of your rawhide. And, and of course, that's a learning experience, like I alluded to earlier. It's a journey we all learn. Hopefully, we all learn from our journey how to refine our work. Uh, the TCAA, Traditional Cowboy Artists of America, has done a wonderful job of educating, trying to educate the current and past rawhide braiders mm -hmm. and you have Leland Hensley, Jay Adcock, uh, uh, Pablo Lozano, who's, who's one of the best in the country, in the world. And then, oh, I forgot almost, you have Nate Wall. He's a really good guy in Billings, Montana. And, and Nate, uh, 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 along with Don Brown, Don Brown's a really good friend with Nate. And, and Nate has helped me immensely also and I've studied his work. We all study each other's work. And, and, and uh, Nate's work is extremely functional because he cowboys, you know, and he understands the deal pretty much in regards to, to uh, cowboying and what it takes to cowboy in regards to equipment and everything. And so his stuff is really, really functional. Uh, and it's very traditional, which I really like tradition. I mean, that's, that's where we're all at is our tradition. We're, no matter what we're doing, uh, playing ball, soccer, uh, riding a horse. There's so much tradition involved if we look back at where we all came from. Yeah. As time goes on, you, you get better with your with your string. You get better with your hides. You, you go to cutting your strings much, much nicer. You get your balance in your, in, your, in your strings and in whatever you're making. You're not using big old clunky strings. You're using finer strings, but you understand the, 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 the one to two ratio and and uh, in regards to thickness and width of your strings and everything, and then you refine it a little more from there, up or down, however you want it to be. But, but uh, and like I said, rawhide is its own creature. You have to understand it, try to understand it, and have to go with it. Rawhide won't wait for you. You gotta wait on rawhide mm -hmm. in regards to the temper and, temper and everything mm -hmm. else. All that you learn and figure it out and everything. And I know I get uh, calls or, or questions all the time on Facebook. Well, how do you know when it's right? How do you know when to start working? it? Well, when it's just about like spaghetti, it's not quite done, but almost. That's where you want it to be when you start doing any work on it. And, and uh, as an example, if I'm working and that rawhide gets a little stiffer, then I put it back in the bag and throw a, paper, a damp paper towel in there with it. When I say back in the bag in a plastic bag, mm -hmm. and and then that moisture will migrate around in there and get it a little bit more right, mm -hmm. and and then I'll go back to work on it. But uh, through the years, uh, I have there's a lot of guys breaking hackamores and bosados, and and rather than get in their way, and some of them are making a living at it, and rather get into their way or take money from them. Uh, I have really concentrated on making really nice quirks and really nice range. Mm -hmm. And and in the cow horse uh, deal, uh, there's a, a quite a few of them using my range. And one guy has got three or four sets of them. 
a uh, very high profile guy. Another guy's got two sets of them. Another guy's got one set of them and got set on order because his wife keeps taking his from him. So, and you know how you girls are. <laughs> and and uh, anyhow, uh, and, and, and they're just so much a person can produce uh, in this deal. And, right. and, and so it makes them just a little bit stuff, a little bit scarce, finished product a little bit scarce. Now there's a lot of stuff that comes from south of the border and it's not made like we make it uh, up here. The guys that, and I'm being very careful here, the guys that, that make it like I do, we have different cores and they send up here from across the line. You know, we have just a different product. Yeah. And, and in my opinion, uh, the Mexican stuff is a great starter product. And, and then our product is uh, for the connoisseur, so to speak, mm -hmm. if I may. Uh, and, and again, uh, I've got to credit the TCAA, Traditional Cowboy Artists of America, with uh, pushing all the braiders forward. I know they pushed me forward and everything to really uh, make my, make, make, thank you, honey, to make my work very nice uh, or nicer. Mm -hmm. Man, my wife just brought me a cup of coffee and some, and some tacos. <laughs> uh, isn't she wonderful mm -hmm. anyhow uh based on seeing their work and how how nice it is and how balanced it is and how the strings are phenomenal uh it's pushed me personally to be a much better to pay attention to be a much better braider mm -hmm. and 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 i use that term a little loosely here and everything because not only are you braiding but you're constructing knots you're constructing a piece of equipment that fits both correctly on a horse, uh, for instance, a head stall, uh, you want the knots on your head stall, the buttons on your head stall to be flat against right. the horse's head. So you want to build your foundation flat. It's okay if it's rounded on the outside a little bit, if you want to, but flat against the horse. Same way, it's, it's just like if you had something with a bump on it against your right. head, doesn't like that very much. Yeah. So that's the deal there. Anyhow, uh, they have really helped the rawhide braiders to, to uh, get going. They had a, Nate had a, uh, a Bosal workshop, and I forget how long ago this has been, five or six years ago, seven, eight years ago. I, I, I don't, maybe eight or nine years ago. Maybe 10 years ago. Hell, time goes on. <laughs> it know. does. It does. But, uh, anyhow, uh, <clears throat> when we started our, our, our raw braiders uh, gathering, uh, we started at my shop. Gosh, this is the 10th year we've had one now. And, and Jan Bogert called me up and he said, I'm coming over to the quarter world. I'd like to meet a bunch of braiders. I said, can you gather some up? And I said, well, I'll try. And I forget how many, seven of us, I think, mm -hmm. in my shop. And we had a little one day get together and we all talked about it and all this and that, you know, how the guys are. We're a little different than the ladies, but that's okay. And anyhow, we had a good time with it and everything, and that sparked interest in the second gathering, and right on down now to our tenth gathering. And I've, I have gone from feeding uh, seven seven of us to feeding this this last this past year. Uh, I wrote a, uh, I fed thirty two people at one time wow. one day. Here. I yeah. paid for breakfast and lunch, and and then it averaged out. I think it averaged out twenty six people. A day is what I fed. And to mm -hmm. me, that's phenomenal that mm -hmm. we had that much interest. And these guys, about uh, three quarters of them are return people. Yeah. About a quarter of them are new people. And the, out of that quarter of new people that showed up there, say six, you say six, then three of those came back the next year. Mm -hmm. Gradually, everybody's gradually growing more. Uh, the deal is growing more and more all the time. Can I ask the, maybe the average age of your attendees? Uh, we have very few young people coming yeah. on, which is disturbing to me. Now, I've had a couple of young people in there, but they, you can't do this with an iPhone. Right. Or a iPad. You've right. got to actively engage. Now, I, myself, if I want to learn something new or if I forgot something, which is entirely mm -hmm. understandable, somebody of my age, I will get on YouTube and Mike Hickey's on there. He, he has all the buttons and everything. Right. And, and I'll refresh my memory with Mike's work and everything. And, and people are getting on YouTube now really 
uh, and it's really helping a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I talked with with uh, Sonny Miller, and Sonny Miller has been a very instrumental instrumental with this raw hiders gathering because he's my contact at NRS where we moved to after we moved out of my shop. Mm-hmm. We were getting too many people, right? And Sonny's really helped us immensely. And and uh, uh, there at NRS, National Roper Supply, those people there have really helped us and everything. And, and uh, David's daughter was the first one that created uh, the Facebook page for us. Mm-hmm. And, and it's it really, really helped us and everything. That, that's our go-to page. And anyhow, uh, Sonny's really, really helped us and, 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 and uh, supported us and everything. For me, in my 40s, it's not super easy to get to a gathering just because I still have kids and jobs and I I'll admit that I look forward to retirement when I have more time to to do this because it is so fascinating to me and there's so much to learn and so I wonder if some of that comes into play about the age of attendees in your gatherings and the other thing that I wonder about is there's a gathering in Utah the one at your place, one in Montana, Pendleton, just the four? No. Uh, the the gatherings have really taken off in regards to how many we have now. Yeah. Uh, we had the first one uh, or second one. I, it doesn't matter who's right. first. One. It doesn't matter. But it's what matters is the number that we have and the support that has been generated from people that want to learn this, that are mm-hmm. fascinated by this art form. And I call it an art form because the further you get into your journey with rawhide, the more you realize how yeah. artful it is yeah. and go to appreciate it. Luis Ortega is our standard. Yeah. It's my standard. Yeah. And he's, he's the one that I really looked up to. And I still to this day look up to him, obviously with a, my work is very similar to his same way as Nate. Nate looks up to him too. Did you all, meet the, him? all the big braiders. Hell, all the braiders looked up to Lewis Ortega. Right. He's the standard. But in regards to the gatherings and everything, there's one in Utah, and you got Idaho, Utah, Pendleton, uh, Montana. Maine, Montana. And then you got this year, they had two out in California. Three, you had uh, uh, Ralph Dillon just had one, had a, yeah. had a deal, deal out there. Yeah. And so, they're springing up all over and and i don't know what ralph's uh, age was of his participants uh i really don't know the age of any of their participants now i just got come back from from uh uh chico springs nate's yeah. gathering up there and there were uh let me think here just a second there were at least eight or more i'm gonna say eight young people there when i say young they were in the early early to mid twenties. Good. So that's, that's pretty young. Yeah. You know? and, it, and it takes, a, uh, you know, you can't just go up there on a shoe string. It takes a little money to get, right. you know, you gotta pay your hotel, your food, yep. plus your entrance fee and everything. My deal is probably the least expensive of all of them. And you get a lot out of it mm-hmm. uh, in regards to food and everything. Get right. Breakfast, lunch. Anyhow, uh, these gatherings, uh, I, I would really like to see some younger people, uh, participating this year, uh, Lynn Yule was one of the first ones that, that was in our deal, and he passed away this year. And Lennon was a good guy. I've known him, I don't know, probably knew him too long. I knew him when he didn't know nothing, but he's always been a good guy, very supportive, and quite the historian. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, we've got a little deal that we're going to do this year called the Lynn Yule Scholarship, and we're going to pay somebody's way to come down, young person. Mm-hmm. And, participate in the gathering and and uh uh i don't know who it's going to be yet we've got several names that we're kicking around it's mm-hmm. going to uh, uh approved they'll be approved by a four five of us three yeah. Four, yeah one of us two of us anyhow we'll approve who's coming in and everything it'll be the one that's most, what we consider the most worthy mm-hmm. and most needy needy yeah and and uh, and one that'll continue on with the with the with the raw deal and I really look forward to seeing who we all agree on and everything. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, do you have information about where someone could apply for that or how that's just, work? just contact me on Facebook. Okay. Contact me or Jan on Facebook, preferably me because I'm right here and Jan is in no man's land. <laughs> I hope he hears that. <laughs> he will. He will. <laughs> yeah. But Jan's a good friend, of mine, really good friend. Oh yeah. I really enjoyed our, our conversation. What would you say is the greatest challenge you faced in your braiding? What is the greatest challenge I faced? The greatest challenge I faced is remembering what in the hell I'm supposed to be doing. No, seriously, the greatest challenge uh, uh, is continuing forward to help improve the learning process of this journey. Mm -hmm. When I say learning process, I'm constantly on the lookout uh, and thinking, by the way, I do think once in a while uh, about what we're supposed to be doing. And, and, and I've had people come in here, uh, want to learn either leather or rawhide and I show them everything I can. Mike Hickey, I told Mike what I did and, and, and Mike sent some books back with me from Billings or not Billings, but from Chico Springs, yeah. next deal. And, and to hand out to these people that come in here, want to learn some of this stuff to help them progress and everything. And it's mm -hmm. books how to tie buttons and everything. Mm -hmm. A really good book. All those books that Mike Hickey puts out are really, really good books. I have them in my, my, my library. And I paid him for them. He didn't give them to me. And I look at them and use them. I use stuff out of them weekly. And mm -hmm. they're a really good deal. And also, Enrique Capone has a set of books that are really good. And very good pictures in them. And, and just about anybody that tries can understand them. Mm -hmm. And so it, they're both of them are great, great authors. So I highly recommend both of them. Good. We talked a fair amount about the younger generation. What would you want to pass on to them? The younger generation is are coming up today. Uh, I would, I would pass on to them that keep it simple. K I S S. <coughs> Everybody tries to make this stuff so complicated. It's not that complicated if you'll pay attention. Mm -hmm. uh, the main, just like Bill Black says, you make pairs and you split them. Mm -hmm. you come to them, you split them. It's pretty mm -hmm. much that simple. Yeah. You got to make your foundations. You got to learn how to lock your top and bottom in and everything. And it's really simple. And I know, I can remember I was probably 12, 13, 14 years old when I learned how to increase a six by seven part button to a eight by nine part button. I don't know if you know what that is. You know what that is? I think so. It, it, it's the start of the pineapple. Model. Yeah. I thought, God dang, the world's come to me now. You know, I'm serious. You know, when you learn that little stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, it was so cool that I can remember to this day, the day and where I was when I figured it out. Mm -hmm. I didn't figure it out. He just fell in my lap. Mm -hmm. But it, I had it, you know. And, and from then on, I was able to figure other stuff out. And it, it, it was a catalyst to let me figure other things out. And, and I was trying to make it too complicated. K-I-S-S, -S, don't make it complicated. Mm -hmm. and, and above all, study and look at other people's work and, and appreciate the good and say, whoop, I shouldn't have gone there. Mm -hmm. Let's go another direction here. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And yeah. And it's not an iPad. It's not an iPhone. You've got to actually study it. Mm -hmm. The best thing you can do is use your hands to do it. Your hands will teach you. Yeah. And there's some sort of satisfaction that comes from that. That's similar to riding a good horse or gardening or, you know, you know. Any, anything you get to do as a hobby or that you do for enjoyment, uh, I know myself when I get done with something, whether it's a briefcase, I tool a lot of leather, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a briefcase or a belt or a set of reins or, or a quirt. When I look back on it, the finished product and look over here and see where it came from. There's a, I got probably six or eight hides rolled up, raw hides rolled up in there and the same number of, of the Herman Oak tool and leather rolled up there in another spot. And I look back over there and see all that pile of, looks like junk there and I say this piece of beauty come out of that pile of junk mm -hmm. 
it's not junk. It's really nice stuff. But you yeah. understand what I'm saying there? Yeah. How in the world? It didn't get there by itself. No. It there. And boy, it's a good feeling. Yeah. Really, it's, it's so self-fulfilling. My wife, Sheila, she sees me after I get done with, with, with a certain deal or with a certain part of a deal. And she says, you've been working again. <laughs> so do you have something you're especially proud of? Uh, you know, when I get done with something, it's gone. Yeah. I have nothing. Well, I have one quart up here. And it, it's a nice quart. And it's not perfect, but it's really nice. Mm -hmm. And the next one, I hope, will be nicer. And, and quarts are something I make pretty much for myself. Not necessarily because I have a lot of time, but because I want to. Mm -hmm. and, if, and, and if I want to tie a long button and put some different color in there, do something a little different. I'll get it. I got several quarts here started. And I'll get it down, get my string ready. The next day, I'll do whatever I'm going to do with it and everything. And yes, I enjoy, really enjoy doing that. And I'm doing that stuff there for myself. Eventually, I, in around this shop, I want to have pegs up here that have work hanging up around here that I've done. Pablo's got a collection of hobbles. He's probably got 50 or more sets of hobbles. And I've got probably a dozen sets of hobbles from around the world. Mm -hmm. and some that I made, some that Jan made, and some that Don Brown made. But anyhow, and some that Jay Adcock made. But anyhow, I want to have a big old set. You know, yeah. we all have dreams and everything. And and I know that I'm going to have to, uh, I, I want to make a, a good part of that, mm -hmm. that uh, product, hobbles, and, and some quirks mm -hmm. that I have made. And of course, that, that'll go down to my son, Zane, and then to his son, Zayden. You know, we all think about the future generations. I've got a really good grandson that's a terror on two feet. But no, he's not. He's a good kid. But you know, maybe he'll take this up. You know, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. <clears throat> um, any other media you've worked with? Like mm -hmm. mohair, silver? No, I don't I don't do any mohair and I don't do any silver. Uh I had Joe Curtis working for me, riding horses with me at my ranch down in Crumb. And and uh he was, he's a silversmith and a good, he's Bob Curtis's son. I don't know if you ever knew who Bob Curtis was. Bob Curtis was a heck of a bit maker, good horse trainer. Him and Jack Kyle were big buds. He worked with Jack and then he built lots of bridle bits for a lot of people that were used. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, anyhow, Joe took up that and, and, and when he worked for me, doing a lot of silver work and he said, come on down here. I'll show you how to do this. And he and Greg Darnell both tried to get me started at it because I can draw pretty good. Mm -hmm. but uh and greg didn't have a and and joe started out with a push graver too and i poked more holes in my hand and i said you guys are crazy i'm gonna go back where it's easy and i went back to my shop went back to Braden. i poked a hole in my hand with an awl blood all over the place i said well you dummy you <laughs> but just one hole at that time yeah anyhow i didn't have time if I'm going to get, if I was going to get good at something, I had to, I picked one thing at that time, and that was tooling. And then about five or six years later, after my conversation with Mr. Brown, well, then I really cranked up and started doing some braiding again. Mm -hmm. And that was the deal. That was a catalyst to get me started braiding with Don Brown because he said, make your own damn ring. So I said, okay. <laughs> Probably the best thing he could have said, huh? Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and of course, everybody's helped me along the way and everything, all that. And that's one thing about the braiders. I don't know a single braider that won't help you. You call yeah. them up and they'll help you. We've all been humbled and we'll be humbled again. Mm -hmm. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. So I think my last question is how how do we make gatherings better and how do we produce more of them? Um, maybe like in the East where it's harder for people to, to get help is, is the TCAA the answer or, uh, how do we get help to the East coast? You mean, yeah. how do we get later started there on the East coast? Yeah. There's, leaders, there's a guy in Tennessee. I forget his name. He came to one of my gatherings and he's pretty good. Okay. And he's braiding pretty good. And it, and, uh, braid and rawhide is pretty much a Western art. Yeah. And, and, uh, uh, the TCAA, uh, I, I credit them with starting together because what Nate did up there, 
with a half of board deal. And then he just, my, he just ballooned out. Right. Right. And, and, uh, <clears throat> to get the East coast in here, uh, they're, they're the more to get people from the East coast to, to start to want to work rawhide and everything or braid or, uh, braid parachute cord or whatever they want to do. Uh, they've all got to start somewhere and it's a little step. They got to start that journey with just one step. And I think like this podcast here, people will get into the podcast and think about it and say, gosh, that sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gardening. I won't get my hands as dirty. They get tired, but it won't get as dirty. Uh, and I'll have something useful to use after that on my horse and everything. And, and I got to credit Randy Roberts mm -hmm. for helping make this thing, uh, uh, gain more and more support, gain more and more braiders because he produces rawhide for braiders and for other, other uses. And, and I can call him up. Anybody can call him up and say, Hey, Randy, I need a, I need a Riata kit. Hey, Randy, I need a basalt kit. Hey, mm -hmm. Randy, send me a quirk kit. Or hey, Randy, send me a thousand foot, a quarter inch string. Right. Well, you know, he's there and he'll do it. And and myself, I used to make my own rawhide, but I don't anymore. I can call him up. I can call Jerk Pistol up in Tennessee, who makes great jersey hides. Uh, there are several other places I can get hides at. And rather than spend time making that rawhide, I can buy it and keep braiding or keep keep doing whatever yeah and, and i've got to credit people like like uh randy roberts for helping the rawhide uh everybody's rawhide journey mm -hmm. there's a ready accessibility of the hide they don't have to make the rawhide they don't have to cut all the string they don't have to do all the dirty work all the all the hard work and yeah. that's it's hard that work is hard but they can just get their product get their string and go right to great I think it's intimidating when you're first starting too. you know, to, yeah. you don't really know how thick or how many strings or, you know, how to math out the diameter for the finished product. And you can call and get the kit that it takes. Who do you call? Randy. <laughs> <laughs> I call Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it is intimidating and everything. And, and, and there's ways to figure this stuff out. And if you'll use your noggin, yeah. Inside the hat rack. You can sit right in your chair in the morning, drink coffee, plot and plan it out, get a pencil and piece of paper and draw a little bit, and you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And if that is intimidating, call one of us. Call any of us and we'll help you. Yeah. Uh, Geraldo Gonzalez. Yeah. Now, he's one that started. He couldn't tie a shoelace when he first came to our gather, and now he's doing good. And, I... and he'll help. Gosh darn, he'll help people. Yeah. And 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 all of us are will want to help. Randy Roberts want to help. Everybody want to help. Yeah. No, I have, I've got a couple of his course and they're really good. I really like them. So, good. <clears throat> um, anything else, any other stories or. No, I, I really don't have any big stories. I've just, uh, the thing, the thing that I want to impress on everybody that this is a journey that we're all on. Yeah. Do not be intimidated by it. Do not be regretful. Think of it as a blessing that you're able to do this. Mm-hmm. And, and and join in our journey because at the end there is light at the end of the tunnel and it is very rewarding yeah personally rewarding, rewarding personally yeah that's pretty much all i gotta say all right well i really just enjoyed this so well, thank good. you i hope it helps you help somebody and all that yep, too. yep. i and hope your tacos aren't too cold well i know some of them warm them up. <laughs> that's awesome all right thank you very much i really appreciate you taking the time to visit with me this morning and 